Hi, this is Ian Wright, and um, I'm just going to do a, this is the kind of first of a, what I would have hoped to have been a, a weekly lecture series, but I'll do it as much as I can because I'm very busy. Um, but um, if you just follow the Facebook page for updates, I'll let you know when the next one is. Um, but I will keep them going because I think people find them helpful and, um, well, you know, anything that would help people along their ways. I mean, the why, the reason why, really, is number one is to share. And I know that people will come in and listen to this later, mainly. Um, it's a process of uh, teaching, sharpening, really. Sharpening what we do, sharpening our, our viewpoint. If anyone knows me, um, they know that I'm... There's two threads to the way that, that we I, I would teach, which is one of them is to do with engaging with unfolding wholeness, dynamic stillness, deepening a deep connection with a process of unfolding health and embryo, embryo dynamic forces and engaging with those to have profound effects. That's very beautiful. But also my own view is that we need to be ext have extreme precision as a tool. Because when we use both those elements, extreme precision plus engaging with this unfolding wholeness, we can unlock this, I think, incredible potential. And anyone who knows me knows that that's what I talk about the whole time. So it's about sharpening the tool. So because when we're treating incredibly precise very complex issues, if we can actually really look at the process of unfolding health in a certain whatever part of the body that we're dealing with, a very specific part of the central nervous system, or heart or something, um, it's incredible, you know, the potential. So anyways, who am I? Um, I've been teaching, um, I'm an osteopath, and I've been teaching paediatrics and cranial osteopathy um, internationally for over 20 five years from, I suppose, inclusive of a biodynamic, um, studied several many years with uh, James Jealous. But for me, it, that was part of it. And just there's more elements that I, more of an integrative process, really. Um, I, I've been teaching with the Sutherland, I'm a fellow of the Sutherland Cranial College of Osteopathy in the UK and have been teaching with them for over 20 years. A lot of focus on paediatrics. I mean, now today, as of today, today, um, I'm working on a project, um, supporting a project, uh, of teaching paediatric osteopathy, especially neurology here uh, in Brazil. And um, they were talking to me about uh, some particular project they're doing with treating uh, microcephalic uh, kids post Zika. Very interesting. So supporting that, working with uh, another group called Unity in Italy, paediatrics um, diploma in paediatric osteopathic DPO, the Irish DPO, which is focused around the Daisy Clinic in Ireland, which unfortunately is on hold at the moment, um, because obviously the group teaching, group learning, there's nothing like group learning in my view, for really solidifying our skill base. And so, you know, when you're learning and working with complex cases with children in a group clinic situation, everybody is learning, every member is learning. And it's a wonderful clinic. And we have people from all other kind of professions who come in and watch and that uh, there's no, I don't know when the daily clinic's going to be, hopefully sometime in this year, we'll be back. Um, the meantime, I'm doing, I, I've got this um, international certificate in cranial paediatrics, which is a kind of online embodied learning experience, um, where we go through quite a lot of complex detailed stuff and build up skill bases each time. It's, it's quite a lot of hours and uh, that's, I mean, you know, there's nothing better than clinical practice. But, you know, that is, you, working in a clinic is the most important, I think, you know, together growing. Second most important is doing courses, hands-on courses where you're learning. Third is where you're going through, you're learning, you're learning the, the applied physiology, the functional physiology in a very complex way. But then you learn to feel that, to actually have an embodied experience of feeling it in yourself and then with others. That is pretty decent, you know, in these times. So the other, my other thread is <clears throat> I've got the book out, The Dynamics of Stillness, um, which is what I would call probably more sensory meditations. Um, 
and I have other online courses, anxiety breaks, and a course in self healing and stillness practices. And uh, on Saturdays, I do a an online um, meditation where we kind of go through basic ways into non dual meditation practices, which is kind of fun. The rest of my time right now, interestingly enough, is I'm doing remote healing, I suppose you'd call it, um, and suddenly working with people from all over the world with incredibly complex issues. And I was, was able to do that before this, I, but, you know, hands-on was my main tool. Now I mainly work in this other way, which the precision is incredible. And I'm working an awful lot with long COVID, um, and it's an incredible learning tool to work with some complex systems and really, really unravel things. And so um, look at my, any previous le lectures, I've got two previous lectures on long COVID, uh, part one and part two, um, which are, I think, valid uh, and worth reading, uh, sorry, listening to if you're, if you're involved with this kind of practice. One on prematurity, one on new models in cranial work, they're all available either on my website or on, uh, on this Facebook page. Now, anyway, stop me, stop bantering about this stuff and let's get on with what we're talking about shock and concussion it's i'm going to talk about it really i'm going to aim a little bit at pediatrics because it we need to be embodied within it i think but it's this is forever this is all talking about shock generally talking about concussion and post-concussive syndrome in general but with reference also to pediatrics and i'm going to talk about a little bit about the psychological physiological processes um, um and then at the end i'm going to talk about the how to the engagement thing you know working with uh, whatever the astrocytes the um traumatic membranous inertias etc etc so bear with me if you want the uh, the how to bit at the end um it's really important shock is it's a huge subject and this can only be an introduction otherwise we'll be talking about it for a weekend or two um but shock can be of a psychological or a physiological emphasis. It could be both, it can be both. Psychological, obviously caused by an emotionally traumatic event, acute stress disorder, strong emotional stress response, and when then it gives you physiological effects, two layers usually, and you see this in practice with people. So I'm gonna talk about this from, almost from a feeling sense, how this feels. One layer, disassociation. So you've got this kind of numbing, detachment, physically detached, decreased awareness. You, you know, your, your senses shut down, decreased awareness of surroundings, dreamlike sense. Can't really even recall it, the memory shuts down. With those, in those situations, you literally have to find them first before you start anything. And it can be traumatic to actually come back into your body. Um, and that's a big subject in how to work with Falklands and Midlines, which I, I cover in a lot of my other courses, including the, the uh, online ones. But it's a big subject that. Um, so when they come back in and they refine their sense, their midline, then they express a shock. You know? At the same time, or separately, it, the midline can shut down, can lock down. Okay, and this you have a lot with babies who have shock from delivery, etc, etc, and they are in some distress. So the midline literally locks down, the HPA axis goes crazy. Um, sleep issues, distress in babies, but this is true with adults who can literally either disassociate or sh lock down on their midlines, but often both. So often once you get them to come back to return to their bodies, then you'll get this sense of midline compression, which can feel dark, heavy, brittle quality to it. Um, important to be able to recognise, because sometimes when we're, we're feeling, if we feel a midline in a patient or a baby, and we feel it too strongly, that tends to mean it's locked down. And that's an important discernment also. You know, people who, for example, children who also can have lockdown midlines can be for example children who have had hyper controlling parents or as an adult if you're if you are very controlled you know and often there's trauma in the background can lock down on the midline so this i mean this is such a, a an introduction i could talk about all these things for, for hours but what's the pathophysiology here i mean 
obviously we've got engagement of the HPA, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. They go into a long-term flight, fight, fright response. Adrenaline, noradrenaline, norepinephrine, engagement of the adrenals, the heart, respiratory centers, the gastrointestinal centers, the liver, stimulates the central nervous system, shuts down the gut, gut and the urinary tract, mobilizes sugar from the liver. Classic HBA responses, which again was about be about five lectures. Glucocorticoids, coids from the adrenal cortex, cortisol, etc. This is the, the mid-term stress response after the first little while. This mobilizes blood sugar, suppresses the immune system decreases bone formation, slows down wound healing. But in the long time, can actually high cortisol, can in the medium term, amongst other effects, damage, as in decrease the size of, decrease the volume of the hippocampus, affecting memory process, but also can help lay down genesis of the amygdala. So the amygdala can grow the hippocampus can go down and that's again a lot of that is, is a discussion about chronic anxiety patterns another day so cortisol natural cortisol in pregnancy it increases naturally at about 30 to 32 weeks which actually in itself helps to stimulate the production of surfactant so some babies some studies mean actually if there's increased cortisol if there's an increased stress medium-term stress response can a, the onset of parturition birth. Too much cortisol in a baby can leave a child hy hypoadrenic, which can affect their, their general growth and development. But they tend to catch up postpartum, but they can be left hypoadrenic and, re and reactive. That's definitely something you can see in children with maternal stress. But there are layers of physiological and psychological stress, uh, shock and, you know, Pregnancy, um, maternal stress, trauma, um, anxiety, HPA access engaged, cortisol effects can affect the blood supply, can in, can produce some sort of placental insufficiency, oligohydraminos and polyhydraminos as well, meconium. Viruses can do it too much. Blood pressure is too high, too low, gestational diabetes. All of the, I mean, this is, again, I'm, I'm skirting over a subject that I spend hours on in some of my other lecture processes. Um, birth shock. Of course, you've got blood supply. You've got decrease, increased blood supply. You have vascular insufficiency, umbilical problems, etc. You've got the physical trauma, the compressive forces, the instrumental delivery, the difficulties taking first breath. You've also got the metabolic issues, um, electrolytes, fluid, temperature, etc., etc. C-section, emergency C-section. You have all of the effects of the above, plus the shock of a C-section, which is a recoil. Um, the baby's meant to go through the normal compressive releasive process, which involves the HPA, cortisol, etc. But it, there's a sense of opening afterwards. In the C-section, they go from being in this beautiful fluid environment, even if it is, if it's an elective especially, um, to out. And they go into recoil and shut down. Mother, of course, can go into shock, emotional, she shut downs. Bonding, of course, oxytocin, hugely important. The ability to bond. Post, um, There are a lot of mothers that we treat who have a mild degree or sometimes a strong de degree of post-traumatic stress disorders from birth, the way that birth was handled, the lack of control in the birth process. You, we know this. We all see all this all the time. And a lot of our time is spent with this, working with these post-traumatic stress disorders. And it's so important to down-regulate the HPA axis, to regulate the, the adrenal cortex, etc., etc., get the pituitary functioning again. You know, pituitary locks down postnatal depression tendencies. You know, again, I'm skirting over subjects. This is a, a weak cause. Um, post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, this is post-traumatic stress symptoms that are retained for over a month. Much more common than you would think. 
a retained flight, flight, fright, hypervigilance, avoidance, recurring dreams and flashbacks. Irritability is very common. Anger, depression, anxiety disorder, social difficulty, so difficulty engaging with others and empathy. Often the case in the mothers, and you can see them, they can articulate it, but look for post-traumatic stress effects in children. Signs they're slightly more subtle because they are not easy to articulate. For example, a baby with who has symptoms. What is a baby with symptoms and signs of shock? Well, number one, they can be extremely quiet if they're shocked. You know, they literally have shut down. Okay, on their midline. And mum thinks this is a beautiful baby. They sleep all day. Um, they're, they're happy. Okay, they may not smile, but they're too young to smile. But they're so quiet. Ooh, sometimes a problem, yeah? So you treat the shock, you release a shock in the baby and they wake up. So beware of this. If you suddenly see a child that's perfectly happy and, you know, in the mother's eyes, who's had, say had an emergency C-section or traumatic stress, in the in the delivery process and they wake up after three i always warn them uh, sorry i'm sorry we have to release the shock but baby's going to wake up a little bit after this or the other side irritable crying colic reflux again huge subjects all of those things how to discern why a baby is crying actually i'll do a, a lecture on that one next time in a week or two because how do you know if a baby's crying what is, how do you discern what is the cause of a baby crying? You know, mothers often can't. This is our, this is where we can use our skill base to actually feel why, you know, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that, I think, because it's, it's valid. Children retain shock, sleepiness, behavioral difficulties, hyperactivity, ADHD can have, because it could be just retained shock. If you have birth trauma that's retained, it can set the tone. It can set the HPA tone. It's, it's like a hyper tendency of the HPA to set itself in a high tone. And the baby can't sit still. The child can't sit still. They have difficulties when they go into school in situations like that. Um, they can have gut problems, headaches, you know, all this kind of stuff. Or they can be very, very tired and sleepy all the time. All things to look out for. What is this? Is there some to retain shock in here? Trauma from a psychological viewpoint, pre two years old. Well, actually, you know, really pre six, pre eight. Can't verbalize it, right? They can't conceptualize it. It's deeply sort of somatic. So I spend a lot of my time working with adults who have had pre conceptual, pre verbal trauma. It's held in somatically and, you know, you've had 25 years of therapy and it's great, but it's still getting anxiety, getting depression, getting, you know, uh, having difficulties with certain situations because yes, they're still holding this trauma, this pre-verbal trauma in their bodies. And it's wonderful. We have a wonderful tool with our work to access that. And I know, you know, I'm talking to, I'm preaching to people who live this and do this all the time. So sorry for saying the obvious. Um, so after seven years old, there is an increase in verbalization and contextualization, which allows them to have a little bit more understanding of shock. Not enough, you know, can you do that even as a teenager? You know, I mean, you know, sometimes as an adult, we can't verbalize and contextualize shock and trauma. Huge subject. Chartered anxiety, massive subject as well. I mean, like, I spend a lot of my time working with children who have anxiety. And, I mean, you know, the, the, the saying goes that when I was working 25 years ago, I was treating teenagers with classic anxiety, symptoms and signs of anxiety. And, you know, 15 years ago, I'd be looking at 10-year-olds, you know, and then seven-year-olds. Now, four-year-olds with symptoms and signs they can't express anxiety but it can be bad dreams inability to sleep night terrors headaches tummy aches unwanting to engage socially shut down etc etc and a whole another another subject but 
you depress the development of the hippocampus, which which affects memory processing, and it de and also you can decrease the uh, down regulation of the prefrontal cortex for us to concept contextualize and conceptualize any trauma, and so that relationship between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala is not so profound and that sets up of course anxiety trauma patterns in the adult very physiological teenagers of course social distress pressure huge pressures i mean pressures on younger kids you know as we know if we're looking at the, at the context of teenagers the way that the prefrontal cortex rewires itself and the huge changes in the dopamine pathways and the whole secondary sexual um, hormones changing plus the social world you've got this massive 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 whirlwind or storm perfect storm of situations in teenagers especially now uh, and so important to for us to be working with these teenagers to just help them regulate if we can get them to regulate in some way it it's so important and um so please treat these teenagers please keep them regulated because there's a lot of them struggling you know a lot of them um right i was going to talk about physiological shock um in terms of blood but i'm actually not going to talk about that because that's too much to talk about i'm going to talk about concussion because this is a really vital subject and uh there's some really great things that we can do with it and i actually personally don't know any form of treatment that is more effective in mild traumatic brain injury, um, concussion and post-concussive disorders. This is so important. So concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. It's a brain injury. There's no messing around with it. It's real. And it's extremely, I mean, I treat so many kids who have had head injuries and head injuries accumulate accumulate play playing rugby classic you know or in ireland the hurlers you know um they accumulate you have one okay you feel a bit rubbish it lasts a few days can't you get another three and they accumulate in the body and if you don't jockeys as well huge amount um if you don't release these accumulative challenges to the nervous system you get to a point, a threshold where things start to go wrong and your brain it will have struggles to recover. I mean, the brain is beautifully designed to actually, it's got these one, well, I'll talk about in a minute, these wonderful cushions, the dual membranes, the three layers of, of dura, the water beds, et cetera, et cetera. It is designed to have that give, but trauma accumulates. So normally occurs after a whiplash type head injury, causes the head and brain normally to shunt quickly backwards and forwards. This can result in altered mental state and that they can become unconscious. Um, usually causes brain bruising, literally, micro damage to the blood vessels and strains in the perineurium of the cranial nerves and other nerves. Um, Symptoms and signs, classic symptoms and signs, memory difficulties, confusion, drowsiness, dizziness, vertigo, blurred, double vision, diplopia, headaches, nausea, vomiting, oversensitivity to light and noise, balance problems with a huge amount of balance problems, slowed reactions, irritability, very irritable, difficulty walking, unequal pupil sizes, very common, seizures it can lead to, slurred speech, 50% suffer from either visual vestibular disturbances, really important in diagnosis of um, concussion is the vestibular ocular reflex. Now, babies, different in babies. Concussion symptoms in babies, it can happen. Baby falls off, yeah, the, 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 uh, the changing mat. Happens all the time, treat it all the time. I mean, literally, two weeks ago, I was just last treating a baby with this. Um, it's different. They can't conceptualise it. They can't speak. There's no slur speak. They can't walk. But they can often get vomiting, drowsiness, CSF, 
through the eyes or the ears and the mouth. Um, certainly hyper irritable or hyper drowsy. Symptoms in children, it's slightly different again. You've got, they can be listless, they can tire easily, or they can be irritable and cranky. They tend to have an unsteadiness walking. Excessive crying. There's crying and then there's excessive crying. And I'll talk about that next time. It's really important. A change in their eating, sleep patterns. A lack of interest in their favorite toy is a good and interesting sign. So you have a child who has hit their head, okay? Now, it's really important to seek emergency care if children have repeated vomiting. If they are have a loss of consciousness for more than, say, 30 seconds, headaches, which are worsening, progressive headaches are a problem, always, always, always get that checked in any age. Uh, behaviour change, quite common in children, quite common. Coordination goes, if they're confused or disorientated or their speech goes, or they have obviously seizures or visual pupil issues. And if the symptoms progress straight into hospital, they're absolutely vital, okay? And this can develop within minutes or hours, days, sometimes even months after the trauma. Now, it's very important as our, in our fields to recognize that it can be accompanied by spinal injury, cervical, upper cervical injury. Very important to be aware of that because actually you can bang your head, but actually the neck can be very commonly involved and we have to make sure that they are correct, safe, there's no, there's no fracture, etc., etc. So again, any suspicion, boom, in the short term, they go straight in. Um, don't move them. Um, but when we tend to see them is afterwards after the the initial i mean sometimes you see them if you you know if you, you run into someone who's banging their head etc it's it, you're there but most often we treat people with post concussive syndrome which i'm going to talk about but what are the tests for concussion there is like a neurocognitive test memory reaction times etc evaluating balance vestibulocochlear balance motion visual tests pupil size and reactions the usual treatments are vision, vestibular therapies, exertion therapies, actually rest and avoiding stimulation, maintaining fluids, avoiding strenuous exercise, allowing it to heal. If you do too much, it can trigger it off. 